says, Nance, do you know not to turn this off? Don't turn it off. Okay, just making sure. Leave it on. Yep. Good morning, friends and church family. Good morning and happy Easter. Can I get a big happy Easter? I love to hear it. Now, just the children. Ready? Happy Easter. Go. Come on, children. Let me have a happy Easter from the kids. Ready? All right. Let me have a happy Easter from all the grown-ups, the older kids. Ready? I knew you could do it. Good morning and welcome. My name is Jeremy. I am one of the pastors here at Mount Joy Mennonite Church, and I want to welcome you in for our Easter service. Today we're doing things a little bit differently, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But first, I want to tell you that Romans chapter 1 tells us that the story of Jesus is good news for everyone who believes in him. It's good news for the salvation of everyone who believes in him, the story of Jesus, not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We experience good news through all of that. It brings us new life to know Jesus who came to earth to live among us and show us the way to the Father. This morning, our service is a little bit different than what we normally do. You're going to see a lot of video story about Jesus. You're going to see different kinds of music, and we're going to engage in this together. I'm going to encourage you to worship with your whole heart, no matter what we're doing. And I want to invite you today into that story of Jesus. May it also be your story today. Let's get started with the story of Jesus this morning. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I've come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus warned his disciples that he would be with them only a little while longer. He went on to comfort his confused followers. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Good morning and happy Easter. We're going to be singing a hymn, a wonderful hymn, a historic hymn. It's When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We're going to sing verse 1, but we want you to sing verses 3 and 4. And I'd like you to pull in your dark blue hymnal. You'll have the words up there, but it's helpful if you're willing to go. Dark blue hymnal 259. Dark blue hymnal 259. And please stand, all of us, during this time. A little bit about uh, Lowell Mason was the man who actually wrote the music to this 200 years ago, 1824. At that time, he was a bank clerk in his late 20s in Savannah, Georgia. But he went well beyond that because he wrote over 1,600 hymns, and he's known today as the father of music education in America's public schools. Again, we'll sing verse 1. Join us for 3 and 4. Just say, I 
Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you were under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. From your burden of sin, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Lord, you are evil, a victory win. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. 
Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they may go to anoint Jesus' body. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook, and he came like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Let's stand together, everyone. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Oh, praise the name of the Lord I God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. His body. 
and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, tremble death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the into this song in a second. And as I was thinking about today and what it represents all across our world, that today many churches are celebrating our risen Savior. You know, Friday was a dark day. It was a day where all around the world we mourn the death of Jesus. For the early disciples especially, they were probably afraid, they were terrified. And then Saturday came and it was silent. They're wondering, man, is the hope of the world gone? And then Sunday came. And when Sunday came, everything changed because the hope of the world is alive and he's risen and he's in this place to resurrect you, to give you new life. And if you're here today and you would say, man, I, I, I need that life. I need that hope. I need that resurrection. I want to feel he's here today to meet you. If you walked into this place hopeless, he's here to give you hope. If you walked into this place needing healing, he's here to heal your body, to heal your soul. If you walked into this place wanting a savior, someone to redeem you and rescue you, he's here. And so I want us to go back into that verse three that says on the third at break of dawn, I was driving this morning and as the sun was coming over the beautiful hills of Lancaster County. I just imagine what that must have felt like for the grave to be ripped open and for Jesus to be resurrected. And so as we sing this again, I want us to feel the power in that moment that his name has power and authority. So can we sing this to, again together on the third? Then on the third at break of dawn the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Sing, oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Oh, oh. 
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that death, hell, and the grave no longer have any authority over you. And because of that, for those alive in Christ, we have a hope and we have a future. And so I pray that future for every person in this room, that they would sense, they would feel your presence. They would feel your love, your warmth, your embrace, just as the sisters were running to the tomb that morning to see you, that they would have a supernatural encounter, Father, for people in this room who need that encounter, who have been searching and longing that today would be the day, Easter Sunday, 2024. So Father, I pray over the preaching of your word this morning that it would move hearts, not just minds, but it would move hearts closer to you, Jesus. We pray over the message, Lord, that Pastor Joel has prepared, and we ask that you would anoint it, you would bless it. And we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. And everyone said, amen. Hey, before you grab a seat, here's what I want us to do. It's Easter Sunday. This room is full. I want you to find three people around you and tell them why you're excited for Easter Sunday this year. Go ahead. Grab a seat, grab a seat. I love it. Love the conversation. We'll have plenty of time after service as well in the lobby. We'll have a coffee bar and a donut wall and uh, some next steps hour as well. Well, hey, welcome to Easter Sunday. Come on, are you excited this morning? Come on, the resurrection. It's such a beautiful Sunday. I love Easter Sunday. I was asking Pastor Joel, how many Easter's in full-time ministry is this for him? And he's lost count. And for me, <laughs> it's been a lot too. And I love Easter Sunday for so many reasons. It's such a joyous time. I love uh, being able just to feel God's presence in a different way as saints both far and near come together to lift the name of Jesus. And so if you're here for the first time today, we just want to say welcome home. We, we say this place is home and uh, we pray that you feel loved today, that you feel welcome. And uh, in the back of the pews, there is a connection card. This is our way to connect with you and to connect you to what God is doing here in this place. And uh, at any point in the service, you can fill this out. Just basic info um, for our home folks. If, if there's a prayer request, a prayer need, or just a life update, you can fill out the back of the card as well. And there's two stations that you can drop those in on your way out. And uh, we would love to get you connected to what God's doing here. We believe God's doing something special here and amazing. And so we want to connect you to that uh, here this morning. And um, uh, just one highlight this week, it's our women's event coming up called Immersion. And uh, this is going to be a ladies' night out. So for the ladies in the room that maybe remember last year, there was a spa night, something very similar. Um, it is going to happen on April 13th from 6.30 p.m. to 9 uh, p.m. And this is uh, open to all high school age and older. It's $15 a person. And from my notes here, there's going to be chair massages. Hello, somebody. Come on, you got some tension in your neck. You can get that tension relieved. There's chocolate fondue. 
There's a charcuterie board. Man, you guys are living it up. There's a soothing stretching session. There's a comfy lounge to play board games and chat. Uh, and then there's a make and take area with a sugar scrub and fresh uh, flower decor and a fresh flower uh, bouquet. And so, ladies, this is an event you want to be at. Trust me. Um, uh, my wife was there last year and she took pictures for the event. And uh, as I was looking through the pictures, I was like, man, come on, guys. Like, where, where's our massages at some event like this, right? Where, where's our chocolate fondue and charcuterie board? No, the guys had a great retreat a couple weeks ago. But ladies, you want to be there. So there's two ways to register. In the lobby, there is an immersion table uh, on your way out. So um, you can stop by that table to get more info and to sign up. And you can sign up on our website right on the church homepage. There's a digital link for you to sign up. And you can even pay online as well. Um, so don't miss that event. It is going to be an amazing, amazing time. Well, this morning, I am excited for the preaching of the word. And so before I invite Joel to come, I just want to pray again over the preaching of the word as he comes uh, to, to give us the, the message this morning. So, Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that the word is alive and active. And we pray over the message that it would move hearts closer to you this morning, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for what you're doing here on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good to be with you. I'm going to be talking to you and uh, sharing three different vignettes or different snapshots from Scripture from John chapter 20. And uh, I encourage you maybe later in the day to take some time to read through the whole of John chapter 20 before you put your head on your pillow tonight and just kind of take in these three snapshots of three different groups of people, individuals and groups of people who experienced the power of of the empty tomb right after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, there's these bookend symbols of Easter weekend, right? Easter weekend, we have Good Friday, and we have the cross, and then we on Sunday, we have the empty tomb, and it's one thing to wear a cross around your neck, right? It's a whole, have you ever seen anybody wearing an empty tomb around their neck? It just doesn't really work, uh, but there is something that works for an empty tomb, and it's this, there is an ancient greeting that's come down from the church through the years on Easter Sunday. And it kind of goes like this, he is risen, and then the other person responds, he is risen indeed, okay? So we're going to try this out. I'm going to say he is risen, and you're all going to say back to me when I point to you, he is risen indeed, okay? You got it? Okay. He is risen. He is risen. Oh, you guys are good. Now we're going to split it right down the middle here. You are, he is risen. And this side, he is risen indeed. So let's start with. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, you guys are good this morning. You guys are awake. So I'm going to say it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. Make sure that you, you greet somebody with that today because that reminds us of the power of the empty tomb that Jesus Christ comes to us this morning resurrected from the dead and in the power of that resurrection. So what does it look like for him to come this morning and do that for us? Well, one of the things that an empty tomb provides for us is this, it's unexplainable peace, unexplainable peace. When, uh, when Jesus came uh, and he talked to the disciples after he had risen from the dead, he comes to them and John chapter 20, 19, and you'll notice I'm preaching this out of order in the chapter, but that's okay. It's these three different vignettes or snapshots, and the first one is this one. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, and suddenly Jesus was standing there among them, and he says, peace be with you, he says. Now, often when I meet with a friend of mine, his name is Eldon Fry, and Eldon serves as not only a friend, but he's also a spiritual director. He's a pastor of sorts to me. And when I meet with Eldon, he will often just say to me, as soon as we sit down at a coffee shop, he'll just look to me across the table. He'll give me a big old smile, and he'll say, peace, peace. When we leave at the end of our coffee time, he'll say, peace. When he signs off an email, he'll just say to me, peace, or God's peace be with you. There's something about us speaking peace to each other, but can you imagine the Prince of Peace today speaking peace to you? Peace to you and peace to those early disciples. Fight or flight had set in, 
They eventually chose the latter of the two, and fear does strange things. It, it, it locked them up not only emotionally and spiritually, but they physically were locked up behind closed doors. We hear this twice in John chapter 20. It says they were locked up for fear of the Jewish leaders around them, okay? And consider the focus of the fear just over this week. The crowds had gone what? From the beginning of the week, from saying, Hosanna, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, lift them up. He is our king, Hosanna to the king. To just a few days later, the same crowd of people are so fickle in their faith that they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And so we know that the religious leaders had a lot of power over these people and there's mob mentality is going on. And so they had good reason, right, to think maybe we're next. And so they're locked up in fear behind closed doors and their hearts are full of fear and doubt. Fear is quite a motivating force. It can also be a crippling force that can lock us down, right? Maybe you came here this morning and you've got some fear of what's going on around you or inside of you. In uh, 2001, a Gallup poll determined that Americans were most afraid of 13 things. They did a Gallup poll and it came up with 13. Why couldn't they come up with 10 or three? I don't know why there was 13. I don't know how the Gallup poll worked, but here they are. People are afraid of snakes. People are afraid of public speaking. If I ask you to get up here this morning, <laughs> maybe I'm a little afraid this morning. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for praying for me this morning. People are afraid of heights and small spaces and spiders and insects. I don't like being around needles. When they go to take blood from me, you better have me laying down or I'm going to be falling down. <laughs> Mice, not so much. Airplanes and flying, not so much. Dogs, I love dogs, but some of you are afraid of dogs. When I read water meters, I was afraid of some of those dogs. Thunder and lightning, crowds, doctor visits. Look at the last one, the dark, the dark. You know, as a little boy, I, was, I wasn't really afraid of the dark. I was afraid of what was in the dark, I thought. And what I dreamed was in the dark. And so... Uh, my mother stationed me in the bedroom that was closest to the bathroom so she didn't have to get up all the time as I was growing and get me into the bathroom in the dark. And so I would still, you know, cry out, gotta go, gotta go. So my mother finally sat me down. She said, I want to teach you this little phrase. And she said, I want you to say it back to me. I will trust in the Lord and not be afraid. I will trust in the Lord and not be afraid. I want you when you're afraid at night and you're afraid of the dark and you're afraid to go to the bathroom, just get up and say that to yourself. She said, now I want you to say it to yourself. <laughs> but I would say it out loud. I don't know if it's an early deliverance thing I was working on. I don't know what it was. But I would get up and go to the bathroom. I would trust in the Lord and not be afraid. I would trust in the Lord and not be afraid. I would trust in the Lord and not be afraid, which wasn't really helping, right? I was still waking up mom and dad and three brothers and sisters. It was just as bad as gotta go. <laughs> but I wasn't really afraid. I was afraid of what I couldn't see. I was afraid of what's next. Do you ever afraid of what's next? We live in a time where there's a lot of fear of what's next? What's coming next? What's going on in our world? What's gonna happen? the fear of the unknown, the fear of what's next. And so Jesus comes today just as he did to his disciples, and I love it how he does this. He comes and he speaks peace to them, and then he breathes on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And perhaps this morning, you need a breath of the Spirit in you because you don't know what's next. Amen? And you need that breath. Jesus, the last time he had met with them, he was washing their feet. The last time they had felt his breath or been close enough to hear his words, he was right next to them. 
And then they see him breathe his last breath, but then his next breath is the breath of the Spirit on him. When God speaks in Genesis, he speaks creation into order. Perhaps today you need God to speak over you, peace, I'm with you. I'm with you in the next step. I'm with you in the unknown. I'm with you in the dark that's coming. I'm there. Peace. And so I want us this morning with each one of these uh, vignettes, each one of these pictures, I just want to give you a prayer to pray. And this is our prayer for peace. It goes something like this. Loving God, please grant me peace of mind as you help me address my fear with faith. Unlock the doors of fear that I've hidden behind. Just as the sun rises each day against the dark of night, bring me confidence each new day. Each new day. So I give that prayer to you. Just look at that prayer for a minute. Loving God, please grant me peace of mind as you help me address my fear with faith. Unlock the doors of fear that I've hidden behind. Just as the sun rises each new day against the dark of night, bring me confidence each new day. Amen. Now I want us to read this verse of Scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, out loud together. Let's read it out loud together. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. Stand and sing this with us. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before him. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring. The praise of
Go ahead and have a seat. So the empty tomb also provides for us something called confident faith. Confident faith. And we learn this from Thomas and his interaction with Jesus. Thomas said, I want to believe, but I won't believe. And he said this to the other disciples. They had gathered at least two times that week, and it was always locked behind doors, and they were locked away for fear. But one time he had said to him, I won't believe, and thus I can touch his hand and his side. Now, that's very specific because he wants to know that it was the Jesus who was crucified, and we know that when Jesus was stuck with the spear in his side, that was always to see, is this person totally dead? Have they had a cardiac arrest? Is the pericardium full of fluid? And so they would stick that spear in there, making sure that that person was totally dead. And so Thomas knew Jesus had been totally dead and was totally crucified. And he said, if I'm going to believe that he's risen again, I need to be able to physically touch where his nails went and where the spear went in his side that proved to me that he had died, that will prove to me that he has risen from the dead. So it says that eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you. I don't know why Jesus kept showing up and freaking them out. He just shows up. Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless anymore. Believe. And so he says to Thomas, if that's what it takes, I'm here. Touch me. Hear me. I'm here. I'm risen from the dead. Then this next encounter that we're considering is about Thomas, and we get the phrase from him that comes down through the ages, Doubting Thomas. How would you like Doubting Thomas to be your nickname and what you're known for? He isn't called, I mean, he does believe in him here, right? He believes in him. Why don't we call him Believing Thomas or Touching Thomas or Reaching Out Thomas or Second Chance Thomas? No, we call him what? Doubting Thomas. And so to this day, we use this about anybody who doubts, oh, they're a doubting Thomas or whatever. And if that isn't bad enough, earlier in the passage, it said Thomas had another nickname because he was a twin. And his other nickname was the twin or the other guy. The Xerox copy. And so he carries these two nicknames. You know, he's, he's the doubter and he's the double. And he's carrying them down, but Jesus doesn't use either one of them. He doesn't refer to him as Didymus. He doesn't refer to him by either nickname. He refers to him as Thomas. And he calls him out and says, Thomas, go ahead, touch my hands, touch my side, go ahead. And then he implores him and he encourages him to believe. Maybe today you need to reach out and just touch Jesus and have Jesus say to you, go ahead, believe. Park your doubts and believe. The fact remains that when people have closely examined the evidence for Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, they discovered the evidence is really clear that Jesus was born, he did live, he was crucified, he did rise again, but you've got to do something with that. One of those people was years ago a young man, and now he's an older gentleman. His name is Josh McDowell. And Josh McDowell wrote a famous book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, but Josh did not start out as a Christian. He started out as a doubter or a skeptic that didn't believe in the resurrection. And so he did all kinds of uh, research as a young philosopher, and he found out, and he wrote it up in Evidence That Demands a Verdict, that all of his doubts, and I, I heard him give a talk on this one time, were based upon his abuse as a young man. His emotional abuse as a young man had caused him to doubt that there could be a loving God. And so when he saw all this evidence lined up before him, he said, it really wasn't all the evidence. The evidence did say there was something I had to do. He said, but in that moment, Jesus came and met me. And he showed me he is a loving father. There is a loving Father that's come to rescue me through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I had 
a spiritual regeneration of my soul in that moment. So maybe today you're carrying some doubts about life. Maybe there are even doubts about Jesus. Lee Strobel has said this, a dose of doubt may strengthen your faith. Can you believe that? A dose of doubt may even strengthen your faith. Let's say that out loud together. Let's read it. A dose of doubt may strengthen your faith. How is that true? Because doubt can drive us further into researching who Jesus was, into reading books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict, into reading our Bible, into asking God, if you're there and you're real, come and interact with me. So a dose of doubt can actually strengthen your faith. So will you let your doubt today drive you toward Jesus or drive a wedge between you and Jesus? The choice is yours. Will you give him your doubt today? Will you give him your hesitation today? Will you give him what's holding you back from him today? Jesus tells Thomas after he believes, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. That's a scripture for us. Blessed are we who have not seen him and yet have believed. Yet have believed. I want you this morning to receive that blessing from Jesus because Jesus comes to you today resurrected. The atoning sacrifice for all of sin of all time. Nail prints in his hands, scar in his side, defeated Satan, death, and hell on your behalf, my behalf, so that you could be paid for, so that when he cried out, it is paid for, it is finished, it is done, that all you got to do is bring your doubt and hand it to him and let him by his Holy Spirit speak faith and hope to you today. Confident faith in the midst of your doubt. Here's the prayer of faith that I have written for us this morning. It goes something like this. Lord, I thank you for the symbols of Easter, the cross, and the empty tomb. Thank you for reminding me today of your sacrifice and victory. I accept and affirm by faith that your death and resurrection are my salvation Thank you for pursuing me, inviting me to a faith-filled relationship with you. Please grow my faith as I put my hand in yours today, just as Thomas did, just as Thomas did. Amen. Let's read this next scripture together. It comes from John eleven twenty-five. Let's read this out loud together. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Oh, the love is dying. 
that we're going to talk about this morning is Mary Magdalene and the empty tomb provided for Mary lasting joy. John chapter 20 begins with this description of Mary and John and Peter running to the tomb and they think the body has been removed or stolen or taken away but Mary stays around. She jumps to the conclusion when someone starts speaking to him her that he is the gardener at the tomb. Uh, we're not told why Peter and John left, but we know that Mary chose to stay there for a bit, and Jesus came and met with her. So they return back, but she stays behind. She experiences this encounter with Jesus Christ. He says to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, Who are you looking for? Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, If you've taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. And then the encounter goes on. Now, you have to remember that Mary had been delivered from seven demons when she became a follower of Jesus Christ. So she had a powerful encounter with Jesus, right? She had been delivered from seven demons from her past. And so she had heard Jesus speak to the forces of evil that had kept her locked up for years and set her free. She wasn't just forgiven, she was free. And she became a follower of Jesus Christ. And so she gave her heart and her life and 
her whole life to him, following him. She also assumes that the body was taken, not that he was resurrected. She doesn't seem to react to the questions from the angels who ask her the same question, and Jesus asked her the same questions. What are you doing here? Why are you crying? Her sorrow and grief seem to have eclipsed everything else for her. She doesn't even recognize Jesus when he engages her with these questions of the soul. She had suffered a great loss. She was in a dark valley. Have you ever been in a dark valley like that? Maybe a great loss and you wonder, is God still with me? Is God still real for me? Is God going to be with me in this time? What is coming next? She's in this dark valley. It clouds her vision. It blurs her. Her hope is dwindling. The man who had released her was no longer around, she thought. And I wonder if she thought, will they come back? Now that he's gone, will they come back? I don't know what was going on inside of Mary, but she was in a deep, deep time of grief. And when our souls are grieving sometimes, We can't see what's right in front of us. Maybe you came today with some sort of deep grief in your life or you're wondering if God is there for you in this dark moment or that if the past that you've been delivered from will suddenly sweep back in and swallow you up again. But the good news is this, is that Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't tell her to buck up and move forward. What he does is he calls her out by name. Mary. Mary. And she suddenly knows that voice. That's the voice of the one who set me free. That's the one who I've followed. That's the one that cried out from the cross. That's Jesus. He calls her out by name. And today he's coming here and he's calling each of us by name. He's calling her name. He's calling your name. He's calling my name. He's calling us out. He's calling us up. He's calling us to follow him, to give him allegiance with all our life. He's calling us not to fear our past, but to turn from it. It is forgiven. We are free. It's not coming back. It's gone. And Jesus calls your name because he's with you. The resurrected Christ is coming to you this morning in the power of the Holy Spirit. What changes for Mary is when she hears him call her by name. The thick cloud starts to lift and the fog moves aside and she sees who he is and she embraces him. I was meeting with a friend a couple of weeks ago and we were uh, having a cup of coffee and we were talking about um, grief and loss and stuff. It kind of came up in the conversation that morning. And he gave me this quote. He said, oh, I have a great quote about grief and loss. And he pulled it up on his phone and he read it to me. There are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. There are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. Mary was processing her grief, processing her sorrow, processing that she thought she had lost the Savior. And so she could see him because her eyes had been cleansed. My mother-in-law, who's from Germany, says it this this way, and she says it in German, and then I ask her to please translate that for me because I don't understand German. And she says this, tears are the detergent of the soul. Tears are the detergent of the soul. So this morning, if you're coming here with a heavy heart and tears, perhaps God's been cleansing you for this interaction with Jesus as he calls your name out. I remember uh, this was a long time ago. You're asking me how many Easter's I've had as a pastor. I don't know, 30 some odd, whatever. You lose track after a while. But I remember when I was 33 years old, I had to go under general anesthesia and have surgery. And um, 
when I was waking back up, I, I remember waking up and struggling to stay awake and then falling back asleep. I don't know why I was struggling. I just remember the struggle, like, oh, waking up, waking up. I want to stay awake. I want to stay awake. And boom, lapsing back into sleep. And finally, I heard the voice of an angel. It was my wife, Debbie. And all, all I remember her saying was, Joel, Joel. And I was like, oh, it's good. I think I'll go back to sleep now. But I was kind of fearing that going, lapsing back and forth in sleep until I heard her voice and I heard somebody say my name and I knew I was safe. And I don't know why I went through that, but this morning, maybe you feel like you need to hear and maybe you came here this morning and Jesus just wants to say your name. And he wants to take your hand and put it on his side and put it on his hands. And he wants to say to you, I'm with you. I've redeemed you. I'm walking with you. I'm breathing on you. Here's my spirit for you. Fear not. We're in this journey together. And I've got brothers and sisters all around you for this journey together. This morning, I want to encourage you. Encourage you to reach out. Here's another prayer I have for you this morning, the prayer for joy. It goes like this. Lord, help me listen when your spirit reminds me to seek your face during times of trouble. Too often I've failed to listen to your promptings. I know you are the source of calm and peace in the middle of my trials. I praise you today for your voice and your smile that remind me all is well. I want you to turn to the person next to you. I just want you to say this simple phrase. All is well. This turn. The resurrected Christ comes to you this morning and says, believe in me. Touch me. Receive the spirit from me. Let me speak your name. All is well. Let's read this verse from Psalm 30, verse 5 together. Weeping may stay for the night. But rejoicing comes in the morning. One more time. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. All right. It's our final song this morning. We're going to ask you to stand. Many of you will know this one. And those who don't, join in when you like. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my till I met you. And I was breathing, but not.
was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end that I breathe in. Easter Resurrection Sunday. Man, such a powerful message. Thank you, Pastor Joel, for that message and those words. I'm reminded today that if you came into this place, hopefully you felt joy. Hopefully you felt love. And if you didn't, my prayer is that God would encounter you at some point today, that his presence would wrap around you. And so we're getting ready to move into the next steps uh, time together. Uh, there's going to be classes down this way and groups for adults. Uh, and then this side will be for children through youth. Uh, in the lobby, we're going to have a coffee bar and a donut wall and a photo booth. And so feel free to hang around, fellowship with one another. I'll be down front here if you need prayer uh, for anything. I would love to pray with you and uh, to meet you where you are. Uh, can we just say one last prayer this morning? Father, we love you. We are so grateful for your resurrection power today. Father, I pray that every person in here, even during this group time together, would still feel your presence. They would feel that joy that you bring today. Lord, if someone came in here heavy burdened, I just pray that burden be lifted right now in Jesus' name and that your presence would just wrap them and clothe them. Jesus, we are grateful for what you're doing here and in Mount Joy and beyond. We love you so much in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Peace be with you.